awesome. Hey, social Dallas, welcome uh, to Take Three. Actually, this is week one of Take Three, and my name is Manny Arango. I'm super, super excited uh, to kick off uh, Take Three, and I got a word for you. So whether you're in this studio audience, whether you're at home, whether you're watching this on your Apple TV, your Roku, your laptop, okay, uh, we hope actually that you're not watching this by yourself. Take three means that you're gonna take three people to your connect group and watch this. Like you're gonna take three people to your mama's house and watch this, okay? Do whatever you gotta do, but this is not isolation at home. It's social at home. And we still want to engage the community of the body of Christ, even though we are at home. Actually, I believe that Jesus is the one that started digital ministry. Yeah, come on. If you remember, the centurion comes to Jesus and he says, my servant needs to be healed. And what does Jesus and the centurion both agree on? That the servant does not need to be there physically. Come on, the servant got healed virtually. Jesus said, I'm sending the word to the servant. And the word of God is actually the thing that changes people's lives. So no matter where you're watching this from, come on, we believe that we're sending the word of God to you to your home, uh, to wherever it is that you're watching this. And one of the things that I love about social, uh, this is my church at this point. I don't even need introductions no more. Come on. Feels good to be preaching like at my home church. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm a teaching pastor here at Social Dallas. And uh, one of the things that I love about this church is how flexible we are. Oh man, I've been to a lot of churches, no shade, uh, I've been to a lot of churches who have spent millions of dollars on grand facilities, but are arguing about the color of the carpet, can't reach new people. Uh, they are not flexible when it comes to reaching young people or unsaved people. But man, not us. <laughs> We're believing God for a building. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. But I pray that we would bring the flexibility that we have in this season into the season when we do have a multi-million dollar facility. Hello. Amen. Uh, that one day we are going to have the best facility in the world. But man, we are a church that's flexible. We're a church that knows how to follow the cloud. All throughout the book of, of Exodus, throughout the book of Numbers, uh, the glory cloud would lift as the people of God were following God's presence from place to place to place. And we believe that as we follow his presence, we're going to get to a promised land one of these days. And man, one day we're going to have a beautiful facility. But man, today we've got social at home. We got take three. And I love the fact that you guys are being super, super flexible. Come on, I got a word for us today. I got a word. So come on. If you are ready to eat, I'm ready to cook, okay? Uh, I, need, I need you to be, uh, even from your couch, wherever you're at, I need you to be saying amen at the screen, okay? And I need you to type in the chat. Come on. If you're already saying, I am going to get perfect attendance, I'm going to be at take three all three weeks, I need you to write, come on, perfect attendance, tell me in the chat right now, you're about to get some perfect attendance, okay? Uh, I don't want you to skip any of these weeks of take three. And uh, man, like always, we always want to show love to our senior pastors, Pastor Robert and Taylor Madu. Uh, I, think, I think it is exemplary um, that they take time to, to be off in the Sabbath and to rest. That is biblical. And uh, actually, I don't know many pastors who obey that command of Scripture in the way that Pastor Robert and Taylor do. And uh, it's a challenge for me. Uh, uh, Pastor Robert and Taylor's commitment to like actually Sabbath and not build it on them, but build it on the power and the move of God is something that uh, is humbling. And it's something that I think we should honor. It's something that I honor. And come on, let's give it up for Pastor Robert and Taylor. Come on, in the chat, in the chat, just go ahead and, and just tell them right now. Come on, they may be watching. So go ahead, let them know like, we love you, okay? We love you, Pastor Robert, Pastor Taylor. All right, come on, let's get to the word. Let's get to the word. Uh, I'm super excited. Uh, I got my iPad with me today. And uh, we're gonna go to Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37. And then I'm gonna take you to Genesis chapter 42, okay? So I'm gonna take you to Genesis chapter 37. We're gonna read that. And then we're gonna go to Genesis chapter 42. Uh, Genesis Genesis chapter 37 says this, uh, his brothers said to him, let me give you some context, brothers in, in this passage of scripture is referring to Joseph's brothers, all right, Joseph's brothers. So Joseph's brothers said to him, 
Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And the Bible says this, and they hated him all the more because of his what? Dream. Come on, because of his what? Dream. They hated him, not because he was going behind their back trying to sneaky link with their girl, nah, not that. <laughs> Uh, not because, like, not because he was gossiping. No, 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 not, not because of anything negative that he had done. But why do they hate him? They hate him because of his what? Dream. dream. I think for a lot of us, the reason that we reject God's dream for our life is not because we don't want the dream. It's because we don't want the division that's going to have to come with the relationships that we're in love with. See, most of us, we're not all addicted to a substance or alcohol or drugs, but a lot of us are addicted to people and validation and approval. Come on, actually, let me get real. Let me get real. Uh, because the way that I know that I've accepted God's dream over my life is when I go to my family reunion, I go to my family cookout, and I got that one aunt who's like, oh, you think you're doing better than everybody? I take that as confirmation. That, yeah, I make you uncomfortable. Yeah, because you're still stuck in our family's generational curse. And I've chosen not to be. Yes, I've chosen to embrace, come on, the dream on my life. I don't want to be stuck in this. And can I tell you, if you're at home, God has a dream for your life. A God-sized dream is something that you can't accomplish in your own power. It's something that you can't accomplish with your own gifts or with your own talent. Come on, it's something that at the end, when you actually accomplish the dream, you begin to say, had it not been for God on my side and God fighting for me, oh, I would have never made it to the place that I've made it. Can I tell you this? If you can accomplish it in your own power, it's not God's dream for your life. Come on, if you can, if you can get a calculator and and say, oh yeah, I've got the savings account to do this, or I've got the money to do it. No, 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 whenever God gives you a dream, it should overwhelm you, yeah. kind of stress you out. Yeah. Kind of say, oh no, there's never been anyone in the Williams family that's done this, or there's never been anybody in the Robertson family that's done this. I cannot believe that this is a dream that God's downloaded into my spirit. And they hate him. I, I love this because, you know, non-dreamers and dreamers can't really get along. Yeah. Like, Non-dreamers and dreamers don't really like, like they don't sync up well with one another. Yeah. It's always the non-dreamers that can live a distracted life, yeah. whereas dreamers have to live a disciplined life. Yeah. It's funny, I, I was a youth pastor for about a decade, okay? But then God delivered me, hello. <laughs> uh, I've got the smell of Axe uh, body spray like permanently singed into my nose hairs, okay? <laughs> Uh, I was a youth pastor for about a decade and teenagers would come to me and said, I don't have, uh, I, I don't have discipline past me. I can't read the Bible every day. Man, I can't pray every day. I don't have discipline. And I would look at them and say, you don't have a discipline problem. You actually have a dream problem. See, if you had a dream, it would actually be very easy for you to be disciplined. Because the Bible says where there is no vision, that's when people cast off restraint. Maybe you think you're not a disciplined person and you've misdiagnosed yourself. Today, I wanna help you because you may think you lack discipline, but I'm here to tell you that the discipline is actually a symptom and that your dream is actually the root problem. The problem is that you don't have discipline. The problem is that there's not a dream that you've embraced. Because when you've got a dream, you are living for tomorrow. And when you're living for tomorrow, it's easy to be disciplined today when there's something that you're living for in your future. But it is impossible to live disciplined today if there's nothing in my future that's pulling me towards my destiny. Come on, we just, we, that was just one verse. Okay, come on, come on. It says this, uh, and they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. We're going to now skip to Genesis chapter 42. Come on, if you're at home, grab your, like, grab your physical Bible, okay? Put a streamer there in Genesis chapter 37 and go over to Genesis chapter 42. Before we even get to Genesis chapter 42, I got to let you know that five chapters of biblical real estate has gone on, okay? Uh, we're now five chapters into the future, but 22 years have elapsed. Joseph is 17 when he has this dream. He is 39 years old when the dream finally comes into fruition. I wonder if anybody is like me, okay? Uh, if God know I ain't gonna walk into the dream until I'm 39, God, you can just go ahead and give me the dream at 38. Come on. 
anybody else with me? Like, like the most frustrating thing. Why are you going to mess around and tell me something at 17? And I ain't going to walk into it for another 22 years. I, I, it's funny. I used to, uh, there, at one point, I was not only a youth pastor, but a young adult pastor. And the young adults at our church would be like, now, um, when I'm going to get married? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> when my husband coming? Like, when my wife coming? And why is it? And I'd, I'd be like, wouldn't it be funny if God saves hormones? Until the day you got married, like you was just at the altar, and then all of a sudden, boom, they activated. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but here we go. The reason, the reason that God doesn't wait to give you a dream, the reason that God doesn't wait to give you hormones, is because God actually needs you to walk with the thing, to get discipline over the thing, so that the thing doesn't actually begin to overtake you, but you learn how to overtake it. You'll never learn how to walk in authority if you're always saying, oh no, I've got stuff, I gotta use it right now. You'll never learn how to be a good steward over money, a good steward over anything, if you need to use everything you have. Guess what? There are ideas that you have right now. You're not going to start that company for another 15 years, but you've got to sit with the idea. There's always stuff that God puts in you that you're not able to use until later because God is not just interested in you achieving the dream, but he's interested in your development as a person. He's in it with you for the long haul, I saw this on Instagram recently. I actually loved it. It said that the person who loves walking will always walk more than the person who's in love with the destination. And that we've got to embrace the journey. That of course God would give me some hormones at 12 and I can't use them till I'm in my 20s. Why? Because I've got to develop self-control. I've got to develop the ability and the muscle to be a good steward over everything in my life. Come on, let's read Genesis chapter 42 together. Joseph is now 39 years old, and the Bible says this. Now Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's, what? Brothers arrived. I would have had some choice words for these brothers. Come on. <laughs> when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. It takes 22 years, but the dream finally comes to fruition. The very thing that they hated him for, oh, they actually do come and they do bow down. They eventually have to do the very thing that God said would happen. I, I, wanna, I wanna preach today. If you're taking notes, I wanna give you my title. Uh, you can write this down. I wanna preach today on this idea, it was all a dream. It was all a dream. I'm, I, it's funny how, like, in my head, I used to read Word Up magazine. It's the next thing. It's the next thing. I can't even stop it from happening to me, okay? Uh, come on, it was all a dream, let's pray. God, I ask that whether someone is watching this way later than, than, than today or whether someone's watching it live right now, wherever they are, God, I ask that you would speak, that you would speak clearly. God, I've got a sermon, but you have a message. And God, I ask that your message would come through with power and precision. God, we thank you right now uh, for the season that our church is in. And we thank you by faith that this message is going to go forward and touch lives and change people. Uh, not because of my skills or my gifts, but because of the Holy Spirit and because of the Holy Spirit alone. In Jesus' name we pray and we all say together, amen, amen, amen. amen. It's funny. Uh, I don't know if you're like me, uh, but I hate when people hype stuff up. Hate it, hate it. Especially restaurants. Like my pet peeve is when someone tells me, oh, this restaurant, this is the best culinary experience you'll ever have. This is the best food you can ever eat. And then I go to the restaurant. Chicken dry, server's rude, you know what I'm saying? And I'm thinking to myself, now what kind of taste buds do you have, okay? Because this food is not good at all. Uh, uh, is anybody ever uh, experienced this with like a movie? Someone tells you, you got to see this movie, best movie ever. You go to the movie, and you are snoring within 10 minutes of being in the movie. You're like, I cannot believe somebody would recommend this movie or this restaurant. My wife actually does this a, a lot. Like, uh, no, no, no shade, but some, some shade. <laughs> we'll be at a restaurant. She has not tasted any of the food. 
The food comes out. Now, I got man hunger. I'm ready to eat the moment the server brings out the food. And she goes, wait, wait, wait. We need to take pictures of the food. <laughs> Why do we need to take pictures? It's not an outfit. It's just food. Why are we taking pictures of food, you know? And I'm like, you hyping it up. You haven't even eaten the food. And you already got it on your Instagram talking about this, re this restaurant is a vibe. How can a restaurant be a vibe? That's not what I'm here for. I'm here for vibes. I'm here for food. <laughs> Come on, people love to hype stuff up. Come on, don't act like nobody's ever hyped up the person they was dating to you. Oh, come on. Come on, come on, come on. Don't act like somebody ain't ever hyped up the person they're like, oh my gosh, I love him. And then you meet him and you're like, mm. <laughs> him? <laughs> oh, come on, don't act like, you know, your boys ever like, yo, for real, yo, I love her, for real. And then you meet her and you're like, mm. she kind of handsome. But anyway, we're moving on. You know, like, we love, come on, we love to hype stuff up. I wonder if Joseph thought to himself, this is a God who hypes stuff up. God gave me this elaborate dream, told me I was going to be a leader, told me my brothers are going to bow down to me. This God told me that I'd break generational curses off my family, and the next thing to happen to me is that I got sold into slavery. This is a God who hypes stuff up. Jeremiah is actually so annoyed that this is a God that hypes things up that Jeremiah is like, wait, 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 you deceived me. You tricked me. You told me that I'd be a prophet to the nations. You said that my words would build up kingdoms and tear them down. And here I am in prison for the stuff that I said. I prophesied in your name, and none of the glamorous things that you said would happen actually happened. Because what happens with Elisha? God says, I have prepared someone to provide for you. Elisha actually gets there, and it's a widow who's about to die, who's broke, who ain't got nothing. And Elisha actually has to do a miracle for her in order for her to provide for him. Do you know what's funny sometimes? I think God takes our selfishness into consideration when he begins to give us dreams. Oh, he knows that if he told you all the drama that was involved, if he told you all the hardship that was gonna be involved, if he told you all the pain that was gonna be involved, you'd be like, mm -mm, I'm good right here. <laughs> so God begins to reveal a dream over your life. He begins to hype stuff up. And you go, yeah, sign me up for that. And then you start walking along the journey. And when the rubber meets the road, you're like, now God, <laughs> come on, come on. I need you to be real. I need you to be real. Like in the chat, I need you to tell me if you've ever thought this. God, I don't know if I can trust you. <laughs> come on, we need all the real Christians, okay? All the Pharisees, you are dismissed, okay? All the real Christians, okay? God, I just don't know. If I can trust you. Anybody ever feel like God has hijacked you? <laughs> Thrown you in the trunk? <laughs> and it, it, it's like, you just tell people like, yeah, I'm just walking according to my purpose. <laughs> but <laughs> ain't nothing in your life going according to any kind of plan. God don't care about your schedule. God don't care about your comfort. God doesn't care about your convenience. God don't care about your feelings. But God has hyped things up in your life. Come on, now, if you ever felt like, I just don't know if I can trust God, you're actually in good company. And I can acknowledge that that is a real human emotion. I have felt that way, and I'm not coming for your life, but I am gonna challenge you. That I have actually learned that it's the immature Christian who's asking whether or not they can trust God. It's the mature Christian that's asking this, can God trust me? Yeah. Oh, when you cross the line from wondering whether or not you can trust God and you actually start to wonder, can God trust me? That is when you go from immaturity to maturity because the immature Christian is saying, I don't know if I can trust this God. And what they're really saying is God is my genie, not my God. 
But when you begin to ask the question, can God trust me? You begin to realize that in this equation, in this relationship between you and God, there's one of you that's fickle and one of you that's always consistent. There's one of you can that work miracles and one of you cannot. There's one of you that is limited by time, space, and power. And there's one of you that is omniscient and omnipotent and he's in control. The question is not whether or not God can be trusted. Are we talking about the God that split the Red Sea? Are you kidding me? Are we talking about the God who took two fish and five loaves and multiplied it to feed a multitude? Wait, 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 wait. At the end of the day, God can be trusted. The question here is actually, can you be trusted? And here we go. If you're writing things down, you write this down. God does not trust what God has not tested. Come on. God does not trust what God has not tested. I'm gonna say that one more time. If you're taking notes in the chat, I want you to like, I want you to write this down in the chat. Come on, God cannot trust what God has not tested. God does not trust what God has not tested. You know, okay, 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 let me, let me give a sidebar comment real quick. Come on, sidebar, that in my notes. If some of us would act that way in our relationships, we, we could stop like forgiving that ex and stop having a lot of exes and oh, 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 oh. See, you, 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 you're mad that that woman or that man did you wrong, but really their last five people that they dated, uh-oh, you should have believed their dating history when they rolled up on you. At some point, you have to begin to go, whoa, 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 I'm not going to trust people until I test people. God don't even trust people. Until God, come on, test people. Now, here's the good news. Here's the good news. I love this. This this gives me reassurance. Every time God tests you, oh, he's not allowed to test you on material he did not teach you. Okay? God cannot test you on material that God did not what? Teach you. At some point, you're going to have to realize that spiritual maturity does not happen just because I grow older. Don't act like you ain't never met a 70-year-old spiritually immature Christian. Hello. (laughs) Don't send them this sermon. (laughs) That's shady. (laughs) I've met people who have been saved for a long time. Time doesn't make you more spiritually mature. Tests make you more spiritually mature. And I know we don't like this, but guess what? Cancer is a test. I know we don't like this, but poverty is a test. I know we don't like this, but wealth is a test. I know we don't like this, but that breakup is a test. I know we don't like this, but even the engagement is a test. Come on, whether or not God is doing something positive or whether or not he's doing something difficult, it's still a test. And time doesn't make me more spiritually mature. Come on, the tests of life make me more spiritually mature. And God is always testing me, testing to see whether or not the stuff he taught me can actually be lived out in real life. Okay, I'll say it this way. God wants to see whether or not I'm just collecting information or whether or not there's real heart transformation. Because Christians love nothing more than to watch 15 sermons on YouTube, but you can't still, you still can't forget your mama. You didn't watch all the sermons because you are collecting a lot of information. You don't need to learn nothing new to forgive your mama who hurt you. (laughs) Time doesn't make us more spiritually mature. Tests make us more spiritually mature. This 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 is where we find tension, though, because for a lot of us, we realize that completing assignments and passing the test is what gets you from the second grade of spiritual maturity to the third grade of spiritual maturity. And for a lot of us, every single time a test comes around, you skip school that day. you like, nah, mm, I'm good. <laughs> here, here we go. For a lot of us, God actually wants you on a level of spiritual maturity that you don't even want for yourself because you keep denying the test. God keeps putting something hard in front of you. God keeps giving you something difficult to do, and you keep going, mm-mm. 
What's wrong with the second grade? What's wrong? What's, what's wrong? I like second grade. Second, second grade, good. You know what I'm saying? I like this. I know all the people. I like this teacher. I like second grade. And God's like, mm, it's half a third grade. And you're like, mm, I got to take that test? And God's like, yes. In order to go to the third grade, you need to take this exam. And you begin to go, mm, I like second grade. But how many of us realize that God wants us to be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And this is why James says, I rejoice in the trial because I know that the trial is there to actually make me mature and to make me complete. God gives Joseph three tests, three tests. And I'm gonna give you those three tests today. Okay, God gives Joseph three tests. I want you to write these down. God gives Joseph three tests, okay? Test number one, if you're... Uh, watching online, come on, write this down in the chat. Come on, test number one. Let's get ready. Test number one, test number one. Joseph gets sold into slavery, but he doesn't just get sold uh, into slavery. He ends up working for a man by the name of Potiphar. He's working for this dude named Potiphar, and then Potiphar's wife got a thing for Joseph. I call her the first cougar of the Bible, you know? (laughs) Like, an older woman likes Joseph. You know, Joseph's young. And every couple of days, Joseph, uh, Potiphar's wife just roll up on Joseph like, hey, Joseph, mm, how you doing, you know? <laughs> you looking good today, you know? Just mad inappropriate. And, and I, need you to, I need you to get this because this is the test of integrity. And I think that's going to help a lot of us. We can't really appreciate how Joseph is adamant about keeping his integrity until we do a little research on Joseph's family. I need to remind you today that Joseph has uh, 10 brothers who are liars. 10 brothers who have told their father that Joseph is dead. 10 brothers who stripped him of his robe, put blood on it, and took it to the dad like, yeah, Joseph is dead. So these 10 brothers are liars, but guess what? They got it honest. Because their father is a liar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you do realize that Joseph's daddy is a man by the name of Jacob. Jacob is such a liar, when he was born, they named him deceiver. Homeboy is named supplanter, heel grabber, deceiver, and tricks his brother, not just out of his birthright, but out of his blessing. Dressed up like his brother and got his daddy to bless him, Oh, and not only is his daddy a liar, his granddaddy's a liar. One time Isaac, Joseph's grandfather, is in a town and he, instead of, this is real Old Testament, instead of saying that his wife is his wife, he was like, but she my sister. (laughs) But guess what? He was only doing what he learned from his father. Because Abraham, before Isaac was ever born, said the same lie in the same town to the same king. So Abraham's a liar. He gives birth to a boy who's a liar. By the time it gets to generation number three, he's named liar. And by the time it gets to generation number four, there's 10 boys that are all liars. And so Joseph is adamant that he will not do anything to jeopardize his integrity. And I've got a sneaky suspicion I'm preaching to somebody today that you're not just trying to live right. You're trying to live right because there's a generational stronghold that hangs in the balance of whether or not you choose right or wrong. So your friends can party, and I'm not saying partying's a sin, but you realize it may or may not be a sin, but it will keep me stuck. See, the question is not, is it a sin? The question is, will it keep me stuck? Will it keep me stuck in this generational cycle? Will it keep me stuck in this dysfunction? The question of, is it a sin, is actually a spiritually immature question. Because Paul already tells us in Corinthians, just because it's what? Permissible does not mean that it's beneficial. Guess what? I grew up, my 
dad was incarcerated for 18 years. He was on drugs, took me to a crack house for the first time when I was five. So when I was like in college, I wasn't asking if alcohol is a sin. I was asking, will alcohol keep me stuck in my family's cycle of dysfunction? And we've got to begin to realize that the first thing God tests us with is typically connected to some kind of family dysfunction. So Joseph makes a decision. I'm not just going to keep my integrity because Potiphar's wife tempted me. I'm going to keep my integrity because the rest of my family line is dependent upon me making this decision for the rest of my life that I'm not going to be a liar. And here's the test. Joseph probably could have gotten away with it. But he wouldn't have got away from the family dysfunction. The question is not, can you get away with your sin, but can you get unstuck from the family cycle that you've been trapped in? You've got to begin to see the real temptation behind the temptation. The enemy's not just after this one moment. Oh no, the enemy knows that if he can get you in this one moment, that this one moment will have a domino effect for multiple generations. Come on, Abraham, in one moment, decided, oh yeah, I can just say she's my sister. Not realizing that my unborn son, who didn't even hear me say the lie, is going to compromise in the exact same way. And then my grandson, who definitely ain't born at this point, is going to be born and they're going to name him deceiver. That get this, it's bigger than me. It's bigger than me. Here we go. Him keeping his integrity lands him in test number two. Test number two is the test of what I call solitary confinement. <laughs> it's the test of anonymity. It's the test of prison. It's the test of hardship. It's the test of because you decided to keep your integrity and not compromise with Potiphar's wife, she has now lied on you, and now you have found yourself in the middle of a prison because somebody wanted to make sexual advancements at you and then you the one that got in trouble. Now get this, get this. Joseph is already a slave. Now he's a slave in prison. If I'm Joseph, I'm upset, I'm big mad. If I'm Joseph, if I'm Joseph, I'm thinking to myself, God must have forgotten about this dream. A bad scenario just got worse. If I'm Joseph, I'm complaining every day. Every day. I'm like, hey, I didn't do it. Get me out of here. And I'm loud. Oh, every day. I would have been the worst prisoner to be in prison with. I would have been like, get me my lawyer. Oh, I don't get one of those. Okay. (laughs) This ain't America. Okay. I'm a slave. My bad. They would have had to remind me. I would have been the worst, but what does the Bible say? This is difficult even for me. I'm preaching to myself. That the prison flourishes under Joseph's care because you want to know what I found? That Joseph is second in command when he's working for his father and he's anointed. He's second in command when he works for Potiphar and he's anointed. And you want to know what I've realized? If you're actually anointed, you don't need perfect circumstances. If you are anointed, you can transform the most ridiculous of environments into a place that is flourishing. Because the proof of the anointing on your life is not whether or not you need perfect stuff. Come on. The proof that our church has the presence of God and is anointed by God is we can do social at home. Oh, baby, we don't need to get in a building to believe and to follow a lead. Oh, no. We like, oh, we doing social at home for three weeks? Then that's what we're going to do. Because you don't need perfect circumstances for the anointing of God to actually flow. You, you know what? You want to know? I've actually realized something even greater. That the anointing of God increases in imperfect scenarios. Here's what I've learned. That Joseph before prison could only have dreams. Oh, get ready. Oh, come on. I love this. It's only in prison that he begins to interpret dreams. To a lot of us, we want to find an alternate route around the most uncomfortable circumstances of our life. 
But before prison, Joseph could only have dreams. He was a dream haver. <laughs> but he actually needs prison to become a dream interpreter because little does he know that the person who's going to be responsible for getting him out of prison is watching him walk through the most painful season of his life. Can I let you know something? Your pain preaches better than any platform that I could ever stand on. Oh, your pain. When you are in significant pain, when you are dealing with trauma and loss, and your neighbors are looking at you like, where are you going today? And you say, to, you say to your neighbors, I'm going to church. And they begin to look at you like, wait a second, weren't you just at a funeral? Didn't you just lose somebody close to you? And you begin to say, oh yeah, but the, the last thing I'm going to do is make a bad situation worse by rejecting God in my life. Oh, no, no, no. My pain actually preaches. And in the middle of pain, God begins to realize, oh, I can trust you. Oh, I can trust you. Some of us, I don't think we like this, but Job was just minding his business. Just living life, having good character, being consistent, wealthy, had mad kids. Job was minding his business. <laughs> Satan has a conversation with God, and God trusts Job's response so much yeah. that it is God's idea for Satan to test Job. Some of us are like, God, keep my name out your mouth. Uh-uh, no, no, no. If you and the devil start talking, don't say nothing about me. <laughs> Some of us are like, that's how God show he trusts. But I want to help your paradigm today. Because a lot of us think if God trusts you, he'll bless you. And I'm here to tell you that actually if God trusts you, he'll test you. Ah. Oh. A lot of us assume, oh, God, if you trust me, you're going to hook me up. And God says, eventually. <laughs> but before I do all of the blessing and hooking you up, I'm actually going to have to figure out if you can handle the hookup. Because the worst thing in the world is for God to hook you up. And then you forget the God who hooked you up in the first place. This now gets Joseph in test number Three. I think this is the hardest one. The first test is the test of his personal integrity. It's a test to see if he can get unstuck from this cycle of family dysfunction that he's been locked in and trapped in. The next test is can you go through hard stuff? Like, can you, can you know that you have a gift that can lead a nation, but now you are stuck in a jail cell and nobody knows you and there's nothing happening in your life that you can post about on social media and you are tucked away and you are hidden by God and God's hand is still on you, but God's hand is not on you to elevate you in this moment, but God's hand is on you to cover you and to hide you. Can you walk through that? He's faithful with test number two. And I, I need to say this right before I get to test number three. Joseph gets out of prison and he actually achieves success before the dream comes to pass. I, I want to stop right here and let you know, just because you have achieved success does not mean God's dream has come to pass in your life. Joseph has now been elevated to second in command in all of Egypt. He is wealthy. He is successful. He's gotten married. He's got two kids. Oh, Joseph has attained success. And a lot of us have uh, mistaken success for the dream of God coming to pass in our life. Joseph is successful, but he has not hit the last test. And the last test is actually the test connected to his dream. The last test is a test of his past. Joseph is second in command in all of Egypt. And who comes walking through the doors? But these trifling brothers. <laughs> these brothers who sold him into slavery. These brothers who have lied to his father and are the reason that he has not seen his biological father in two decades. These brothers who before they sold him into slavery threw him in a cistern. That's just fancy Bible word for a well then threw this boy in a well. I'm, I'm scared of d the dark and tight spaces. I'm like, a well, throwing me in a well. This is terrible. They have robbed him of his clothes. I mean, this is just, these, all because they're jealous. All because they're still stuck in their family dysfunction. Now, do not judge me. 
I can feel, I can feel the judgment. <laughs> Do not judge me. But if it was me, and my brothers came walking in the door, and I'm the most, the second most powerful person in the whole country, I'd have a couple words for these brothers. Three words, actually. I, don't, I only need three. Guards, spear them, okay? They would have died. It's giving death, okay? <laughs> they would have died that day, okay? It would have been over, okay? Like, I'm... <laughs> I feel, I feel the judgment. Y'all like, he ain't saved. He ain't even saved. (laughs) You know what's funny? Had Joseph killed his brothers, he actually would have been killing the very dream that God had given him. Because bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness will kill everything that God is actually trying to do in your life. Resentment and bitterness will keep you stuck more than an addiction, more than alcohol, more than drugs. Oh, for a lot of us, you've beat the generational curse of alcoholism in your family. You've beat the generational curse of incarceration in your family. You've beat the generational curse of drugs or some kind of addiction in your family, but you still haven't forgiven the people from whom you got the generational curse from. For some of us, We have beaten, you're the first person in your family to go to college, you're the first person in your family to own your own business, you're the first person in your family to be married, to have a kid uh, after you was married, not before, hello. But you still walk around angry and bitter and full of resentment and you are holding people who could not be the best parents for you that you thought you deserved. Can I help you let go today? Because if they had had it to give, they would have given it to you. If you walk up to me and you ask me for $100 in cash and I tell you I don't have it, it doesn't matter how much you tell me you need it, it doesn't, tell, it doesn't matter how much you tell me you need it for. I could believe in why you need it. I could want to give it to you, but if I don't have it to give, then I will stand there and just look at you with a disappointed look on my face, with my eyebrows raised and confused. And you want to know the day I got free? Because my dad took me to a crack house and I was five. Oh, I had baggage. I had trauma. I had some deep forgiveness to work through. Is the day I realized that I was asking someone to give me something that they did not have it to give. Just because they brought you into this world does not mean that they have everything that you need for them to give you. And the day that I actually released my dad and let him go and forgave him, oh, that's when God began to provide spiritual uncles and spiritual fathers and spiritual family for me. Do I want to know what I believe in God for social at home to do, for church to bring you in your home together with people that maybe are not your biological parents, but maybe are going to become some spiritual family in your life? Because God begins to say, I put the lonely in families. You want to know what I realize? All those aunts and uncles and spiritual parents that began to bless me, they were around me all the time. And I didn't have eyes to see them because I hadn't forgiven my dad yet. It's not that they appeared, it's that my eyes were finally open to their availability in my life because I finally got some healing and I got to a place where I could bless my dad. I remember the day that I called my father and I was like, dad, thank you. He was like, for what? Oh, he was confused. And I was like, thank you, Dad. Your gift of gab, your ability to talk your way into anything and out of anything. I mean, the enemy made you use that for manipulation. But guess what? It planted a seed in me. And I used that same gift to preach the gospel. Amen. God, thank, get, Dad, thank you. I'm not going to hold you in bitterness. I'm not going to hold you in unforgiveness. I'm going to release you because anything that you hold on to, you are actually in an intimate relationship with. For some of you, you need to let go because you're not just letting them go, you're letting yourself go. You cannot be free from anything that you hold on to. 
If you hold on to people who have hurt you, wronged you, I don't care if it's an ex, I don't care if it's somebody that you dated years ago, I don't care if it's a coach, I don't care if it's a professor that spoke negative words over your life, you cannot move forward in life looking through the rearview mirror of your life at all times. For some of you, your past has gripped you. And I thought I was done with this sermon. Come on, three tests, you know? Joseph is tested. And then I begin to realize that Joseph had biological brothers that did not believe him. He shared his dream with them. He shared his identity with them. And they did not what? They did not believe him. And Jesus also had biological brothers who, although Jesus told them who he was, although Jesus shared with them his identity and his dream, his biological brothers did not believe him. I realized that Joseph was actually tempted, but held on to his integrity. And do you want to know what the Bible says about Jesus? That he was tempted in every way, yet was without sin. This man named Joseph, not only was he tempted, but because he was in innocent, he had to have someone lie to get him in prison. He had to have a false accusation in order to wind him up in prison. And do you know this man named Jesus? He had done nothing wrong. Therefore, the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees had to lie, had to get people to lie on Jesus in order to get him in prison. Oh, it doesn't stop there. The man, Joseph, that we've been talking about all day today, oh, that man named Joseph is condemned with two criminals the cupbearer and the baker. One of those criminals is going to be restored to their proper position, and one of those criminals is going to get beheaded. Jesus is on the cross with what? Two criminals. One of those criminals is going to be, hear the words, today you'll be with me in paradise. The other criminal is not going to hear those words. It doesn't stop there. The brother that's responsible for selling Joseph into slavery, his name is Judah, and he sells Joseph into slavery for 30 pieces of silver. Do you want to know what the Greek translation of Judah is? Oh, it's Judas. And Judas sells Jesus into bondage for 30 pieces of silver. Oh, Joseph was stripped for his robe that his father gave him. And Jesus, at the foot of the cross, they cast lots for his robe because he was king. Do you know that this man by the name of Joseph. Oh, they put him in a cistern. They put him in a cistern and they thought that when they came back, they'd find a corpse, but they didn't find a corpse. They found someone who was alive. And do you know that on the Sunday after they crucified Jesus, they thought they were going to come to the tomb and find a corpse, but they did not find a corpse. They found a living God, the King and Savior of the world. And by the end of the story, Joseph's brothers, oh, they finally bowed down. (laughs) Whether they wanted to or not, they bowed down. And Philippians chapter 2 tells me this, that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You want to know what I realized by studying the life of Joseph? The story was never about Joseph. The story was always about Jesus. I want to live my life in such a way that when people read the pages of my life, they don't see a lot of Manny, but they see a lot of Jesus. When they see how I forgive people who have wronged me, they see Jesus. When they see how I've broken out of generational cycles, they see Jesus. When they see how I got integrity, even though my family didn't teach me that integrity, they see Jesus. When they begin to see somebody who can walk through the heart seasons of life and get better. Oh, they see Jesus. Do you want to know what every test is designed to do? Make you more like Jesus. Oh, I'm an evangelist, not because I've got a microphone in my hand. I'm an evangelist because my life looks like Jesus. That's God's dream for your life. Is that your life would look like Jesus' life? That when you go about your day as an entrepreneur, as an employee, as a son, as a daughter, as as an uncle, as an aunt, as as a friend, as a dad, as a mom, that people would look at you and go, I can't put my finger on it. 
There's something countercultural about you. I know this sermon series is old, but there's something socially awkward about you. There's something about you that doesn't match with our current culture's values. There's something about you that smells like Jesus. There's something about you that demonstrates Jesus. Maybe you're watching this. Maybe you're in the studio audience. And you can admit, man, Pastor Manny, I'm going through a test right now. Oh, my faith is being tested. My consistency is being tested. My character is being tested. I'm not in the most comfortable season. But you know what? I can realize that God's trust for me is on the other side of these tests. If that's you, just type in the chat. Just type in the chat. That's for me, Pastor Manny. That's for me. You're praying for me. I want to know who I'm praying for. I'm going to pray. And I'm going to pray that you wouldn't get weary in well-doing. But that in the test, you would begin to learn every, you would begin to remember every single lesson that the Holy Spirit has ever whispered into your ear. I wonder today if this sermon isn't just new information, but it's actually bringing back to your memory a bunch of stuff that you may already know, but that you need to put into practice. If you're in the middle of a test today, I wanna pray for you. God, I thank you for my church family. Wherever they're watching this, God, I ask that they be encouraged in the middle of this test. That God, that your glory would be on the other side of this test. God, the enemy wants to tempt us, but God, you are a God who wants to test us. The enemy wants us to fall prey into temptation, but you are always cheering us on, believing that we have it in us to make it through the storm, to make it through the trial, to make it through the opposition. God, I ask that supernatural grace would be on everybody who's watching this right now. That Lord God, that you would do what no pastor or speaker could do. But God, that you would heal hearts, that you would cause forgiveness to actually be active in our life. Not for us to just hear a sermon about forgiveness, but for us to realize that we will fail in this season to be like your son if we don't embrace forgiveness. Come on, God, right now, even in the chat, even as people are watching online, God, we give up resentment right now in Jesus' name. The poison of unforgiveness that we've been drinking, we declare right now today's the last day that we're gonna hold that person in unforgiveness. Today's the last day that we're gonna replay in our mind all the things that they did to us, but we're gonna start replaying in our mind what you did for us. God, it's your cross that causes us to forgive anybody in our life who's harmed us, anyone in our life who meant evil. Like Joseph, we're saying today, what the enemy meant for evil. Come on, God, you meant it for good. And God, we ask that we would adopt your perspective today. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, and we all say together, amen, amen, amen. Come on, if you're in the chat and you receive that prayer, can you type amen in the chat? We love you. We'll see you next week for week two of Take Three.